So what game is this? It's called Death Stranding. It's Kojima's new game. Oh, neat. What are you doing right now? I am delivering a package. So this is like a side quest or something? Nope. This is the main game. Oh, so it's sort of like a payload kind of thing? Do you have to, like, fight off aliens and defend your cargo or anything like that? Nah, not really. You sort of just ride around delivering packages. You don't really see anybody at all most of the time. So, this is it? This is, like, the entire game? Yeah, more or less. But, like, you gotta know the lore, though. Like, three hours of cutscenes at the beginning, right? You get through that. They don't make much sense, don't worry about it, but you have this disease called Dooms, right? And there are these invisible monsters called BTs that you can bump into sometimes. It's like really cool. Oh, and you have this little baby strapped to you called a BB. BB, BT, similar. And, oh, yeah, I forgot to say, if the rain touches you, it makes you old and like everything else super old. But you can come back to life after you die, so that's like nice. How much did you pay for this again? On November 8th of 2019, Hideo Kojima, the mastermind behind the Metal Gear Solid franchise, released the first game from his solo production company, Kojima Productions. Death Stranding was one of the most hyped games of the year, but upon release it was met with a relatively mixed response. The gameplay was overwhelmingly boring, the story needlessly complicated. Death Stranding is one of the most disappointing video games I have ever played. If history had gone a bit differently, Death Stranding might be remembered as little more than another weird Kojima game about a post-apocalyptic postal worker. But history did happen. And for Death Stranding, history changed everything. Death Stranding throws you headfirst into a world that has neither the time nor the energy to explain itself to you. The game hits you over the head with a dictionary of new jargon to learn while expecting you to just roll with the punches. Tears. A chiral allergy. So, you have dooms, like me? I've got the extinction factor, but I think you got me beat. What's your level? You can see them, right? No, but I can sense them. Level two, then. Thankfully for us, I have both the time and the energy, so if you'll allow me, I'd like to go a little bit into the basics of Death Stranding, just so we're all on the same page. Sometime in the not terribly distant future, the worlds of the dead and the living started to blur into one another due to human interference with a sort of limbo world known only as the beach. The impacts this had on human life and the environment are collectively known as the Death Stranding, and the Death Stranding brought some strange stuff with it. Necrotic beings from the afterlife known as Beached Things, or BTs, become stranded in our world, causing mass destruction when they come into contact with the living. People sensitive to the presence of death and the BTs are said to have a condition known as dooms, and humanity has created a slew of technology that makes traversing the BT-ridden environment possible, like bridge babies. Due to the blurred line that exists between life and death, some people, known as repatriates, are even able to resurrect themselves from the dead. In Death Stranding, you play as one such dooms-afflicted repatriate, a delivery man named Sam. You're contracted with a huge corporate political entity known as Bridges. Your task is simple trek across America, and reconnect cities that have been ravaged and isolated by the Death Stranding. How do you do this? By making deliveries and connecting the cities to a centralized network. You could sort of think of bridges as Amazon, and the only way for America to become whole again is if everyone gets Amazon Prime so they can communicate. Your journey leads you through all sorts of beautiful scenery and has you meeting with bizarre and enigmatic characters, but the one thing that stood out to me first while playing Death Stranding was the setting more than anything. Abandoned cities, huge swaths of land that are utterly uninhabited. Places where life clearly once was, but is now not. But the thing is, people are here. The world of Death Stranding is not uninhabited. But everyone is so deeply hunkered away out of fear of the catastrophe ravaging the surface that your forms of contact are limited to holograms and radio chats. In fact, excluding cutscenes, you never actually interact with any other player models that aren't the generic enemies trying to kill you, save for some spoilery plot moments towards the end of the game. In Death Stranding, you traverse a world, and that world is incredibly empty. Maybe if I'd played Death Stranding in 2019, this would have all been meaningless to me but I didn't play it in 2019. In fact, that whole skit in the opening was entirely made up. 
I didn't get around to playing Death Stranding until 2021, and by that time, the game and its themes of isolation, emptiness, and death became something that Kojima could have never seen coming. History has a way of changing the way we think about art. In film critic Roger Ebert's review of The Fellowship of the Ring, he describes it as a work for and of our times. Ebert wasn't referring to the times of today, of course, he was referring to the time when Fellowship of the Ring was released. In December of 2001, only three months after the devastating attack on the World Trade Center. Ebert wrote that Fellowship was a film of its time because, in a world where adversity, an enemy, had become a looming shadow over the lives of Americans once again, stories of good triumphing over evil like Lord of the Rings were needed. In an article for the Chicago Tribune, Christopher Borelli wrote about the impact that Fellowship of the Ring had in a post-9-11 world. The first minute of the film delivered a queasy jolt of immediacy, a chill of recognition. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. Much that once was is lost. Borelli went on to write about a particular exchange between Frodo and Gandalf from Fellowship that became something of a cultural cornerstone for Americans to lean on post-9-11. A testament to all that our society had collectively gone through, and a word of solemn encouragement to continue pushing forward. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. In a conversation I had recently with film scholar Max Tallinn about the post-9-11 reaction to Fellowship, he offered some reflection on this particular moment. I know that there were a lot of us in the audience who felt like 9-11 was another such occasion that had been thrust upon us in a similar way, a battle between good and evil that we had to reluctantly rise to meet. Starting in early 2002, with the world still reeling from the attacks, the New York Times started running ads for the film that only featured Frodo and Gandalf accompanied by this dialogue in text. There was no missing the implication. Fellowship of the Ring was a 9-11 movie. It didn't try to be, it wasn't necessarily meant to be, but deeply and truly, it was. And in exactly the same way, Death Stranding is about COVID. I don't think I would have given Death Stranding much thought at all if I'd played it in 2019, but I played it in mid-2021, deep in the thick of the coronavirus pandemic. And what's strange is that looking back to those surreal early months of the pandemic, the world outside our windows wasn't terribly different from the world Sam traverses in Death Stranding. The overload of strange vocabulary that the game expects you to pick up on made me reflect upon the way our real-life pandemic has altered our vocabulary. Two years ago, things like N95 masks, PCR tests, social distancing, remote learning, wouldn't have been regular parts of our vernacular the way they are now. As in the world of Death Stranding, our own world felt eerily abandoned after the pandemic hit. Once densely populated city centers turned almost instantly into ghost towns, friendly gatherings and business meetings were replaced by FaceTimes and Zoom calls. Your playable character in Death Stranding, Sam, suffers from halfophobia, the fear of human contact. All I can think of when I see Sam recoil at the potential of touching another person is social distancing. Suddenly, the once science fiction world of Death Stranding started to look a whole lot more familiar. Deliveries became our saving grace. A study by McKinsey and Company reveals that the food delivery industry doubled in value during the pandemic. Postal workers, Amazon Prime, and Grubhub drivers became our heroes, bringing us items that we could no longer simply leave the house to get. Playing through the journey of Sam Porter Bridges in Death Stranding today feels a lot like a love letter to the delivery men and women who kept our country running during the worst of the pandemic. Now, I'm not trying to sensationalize a global disaster, but when you read the words of postal workers during the pandemic, it's hard not to see the comparison. The other day, a perfect stranger came up to me and said, thanks for your service. You guys are doing a great job. I'm not in the military. I deliver the mail. As we go about our day, my fellow carriers and I are imbued with a renewed sense of purpose, knowing our customers remain thankful for the work we do. We're seeing small gestures of gratitude, a bottle of wine, gift cards, and handwritten notes left in mailboxes expressing thanks. 
Smiles are wider, mailboxes are emptied more frequently. There's a sense of relief that at least mail delivery remains dependable and stable in what has been an uncertain and unstable time. These are the words of Bruce Maiman, a mailman in Northern California from April of 2020. But these words could have just as easily been taken from Death Stranding. But why point any of this out? What is there to be gained from recognizing that the events of a piece of art are unintentionally yet undeniably parallel to those of our own lives? Well, if you ask me, a whole lot. When it comes to analyzing art, whether that be literature, film, paintings, or video games, it's become almost a given that one must also consider the historical context of the piece. I'm sure when you read Huckleberry Finn in school, your teacher probably took some time to explain that the book was published during the Jim Crow era, and as such, that the story is full of commentary on social issues of the time. Just the same, writers like Borelli have examined how Fellowship of the Ring's proximity to 9-11 has had a major impact on the way we remember the film. Whether this historical context is used to excuse problematic stories as just a product of their time, or to better appreciate the significance of a piece of art is another discussion altogether. But the bottom line is that art cannot be easily separated from the time of its release. The discussion of a work's historical context usually centers around texts from the past, but I feel that too often we ignore the context and social moments surrounding art from the present day. We've said that you cannot divorce art from its context without removing part of the picture. So when I ask what is Death Stranding about, I'm asking two questions. One about the content of the game itself, and one about how that game fits into its place in history. Recall that Death Stranding was released in November 2019, roughly four months before COVID went off the rails. From the moment I'm writing this, the game has spent more time existing within a pandemic than not. And so while Death Stranding's connections to COVID were almost certainly unintentional, the two can no longer be separated from one another. History has bound them together. Just as Fellowship of the Ring became a 9-11 movie, Death Stranding is undeniably a COVID game. But the binding of art to its time isn't something only done to improve the accuracy of our analysis, either. To say that Death Stranding is about COVID isn't only about drawing hyperbolic comparisons. This connection has utility. When you remove Fellowship of the Ring from its historical context, it's a movie adaptation of a beloved franchise. But when you consider the fact that this archetypal story of good reluctantly resisting evil was released right after 9-11, it becomes something much more profound. It was a tool for viewers to use to navigate the times they found themselves in. In some sense, viewers could look to fellowship, see themselves on the screen, and have an example of how they might want to confront their situation. So while at first glance, Death Stranding's kinship with COVID may seem like just a funny coincidence, in reality, this connection can and should serve as something much more profound. It's a guide. I've talked in previous essays about this idea of using stories as a framework we can use to orient ourselves. Then, it was about using Red Dead Redemption 2 as a model for how we should confront entropy. Now, when faced with a global health crisis, we can look to stories like Death Stranding that offer a conveniently similar narrative to provide us comfort, and just maybe a way forward. Within Death Stranding, there's a phrase that gets thrown around by members of the Bridges Corporation. The rest of us to rebuild America. In the game, it embodies your mission to trek across the country, linking cities to a central network. After Calamity has left the nation isolated and blight-ridden, you are one of the many porters doing their part to bring everyone back together. Reconnect America starts to sound a whole lot like flatten the curve when playing Death Stranding after 2020. And as time goes on, both in the game and in our lives, whether or not the goals behind these slogans have any substance to them becomes less and less clear. Is there really a way to beat this? To reconnect America in a post-catastrophe world? Can we go back to what life was like before, and is that even a good idea anymore? These are the sorts of questions Death Stranding asks, and they're questions I think many of us have considered at one point or another during our own journey through the pandemic. But whereas in our life, where the answers to these questions may not reveal themselves anytime soon, when looking at a story like Death Stranding, the answer is clear. So, what is Death Stranding about? It's about male men at the end of the world, and it's about COVID, but more importantly, Death Stranding is about hope. In spite of the rampant death, the fractured and isolated society, and his own disillusionment, Sam Porter Bridges never gives up on his goal to reconnect America. He doesn't stop making those small deliveries, the old records, the much-needed medical supplies, the good old pizzas that bring joy to their recipients. There are several missions in the game that see Sam connecting people in ways that would have otherwise been impossible. 
You deliver a bride to her groom after the Death Stranding separated them. You aid essential workers by constructing bridges and other important infrastructure. And you provide valuable data samples that help the scientists of the world in fighting back against the Death Stranding. In the face of the deepest crises, Death Stranding stresses the urgency of connecting with one another not allowing ourselves to fall into isolation and cynicism. And perhaps Death Stranding's optimism for the future isn't entirely unrealistic either. At first, the pandemic had us locked inside, cut off from our loved ones, but as time marches onward and we adjust to our new normal, we find ways to reconnect. Despite the fact that our battle against COVID often feels like one step forward, two steps back, we keep on moving. The world of Death Stranding isn't at all perfect by the time the credits roll. It's clear that the effects of the Death Stranding will stretch on for generations. And yet, we're given plenty of reason to believe that we will one day reconnect. We will reach our destination, one painstaking step at a time.